Hello, students, friends, and colleagues. Um, my name is Farouk Day. I am the Vice Provost for Integrative Learning and Life Design at Johns Hopkins University. And about a month ago, I launched Vision Chats, a series um, where I invite guests from uh, the corporate world, from higher education world, to talk about what will happen in the future. We are in a moment right now where we are experiencing major paradigm shifts in the way we behave, we buy, we consume, we learn, we work. And um, there is one way to look at this moment right now and think of it as a snowstorm that'll pass and we'll just hunker down until um, at that moment. Or we can look at this as an opportunity for us to ride this paradigm shift and create opportunities for a future. So what better way to think about the future and envision the future and begin to act accordingly than to have conversations with uh, people who are doing the work out there. Um, so this time I've invited three of my colleagues and friends, uh, Sean Vanderzeel, who is the new executive director of the National Association of Colleges and Employers, I've invited my friend David Ong, who is the Director of Corporate Recruiting at Maximus, and uh, back by popular demand, Christine Kursbergara, who is the VP for Higher Education and Student Success at Handshake. And we started the, what, what ended up being just an awesome conversation about the world of work, internships, the movements that are happening in the economy, what colleges could do, what employers could do, and more importantly, what students could do right now to ride this wave and to uh, make the most out of what is certainly a very difficult situation. And we started the conversation with Sean Vanderzeel, who um, uh, was describing to us what was uh, happening in um, uh, the world of work today based on some surveys that they have sent out. Um, so join me now in this conversation and you'll we'll start with Sean who will share with us some of the results. We're seeing that it's about 15% of our employers that we represent um, are revoking internship offers. So there, that's a significant number, 15%, but another way to look at it is that it's only 15% in this environment uh, that we're in. Um, and the other uh, piece of it is, is that we're only finding that about 2% are revoking full-time offers that had already been given for graduating seniors. So those that had extended offers, um, for those that are gra graduating coming up, only 2% are revoking those offers. So 15% on the internship side and only 2% on the full-time side. So if there's a little bit of good news and, and hope in there, um, that, that's where we're, we're finding it right now. Um, are, uh, Sean, I I'm, I'm wonder if uh, the, uh, the sample size uh, uh, is, is enough to, uh, to say that 2% is representative of what's happening with NACE. Is that something that you're, you're aware of? Yeah, so um, that's of about 275 respondents so far. Um, so it's a pretty decent sample size, uh, what we find generally in reflecting in the marketplace. But the, those numbers, again, will continue to change and evolve. And we're actually publishing those numbers every Friday um, uh, during this month. And they have changed um, every week. Um, but I think we'll find, hopefully we'll find that those numbers uh, don't, don't move too much further. Christine, do you see any kind of change in activity from employers when it comes to posting internships, say, for example, this year over last year? Or are you seeing um, companies pulling down internship um, postings that they might have had on Handshake? I'm, I'm sure that Handshake is probably a very good bellwether for this as well. So. Yeah, thanks, David. Definitely seeing some different activity in terms of lesser numbers um, when it comes to postings of internships. However, there's still a lot of employers that are hiring right now. And so I think sometimes the media uh, frenzy and everyone wanting to talk about how everyone is revoking or rescinding internships or jobs, the reality is it's not actually happening quite to the level that the media might sort of frighten students or their parents. Um, in thinking. And so we're actually still seeing quite a number of internships and uh, jobs being posted on, on Handshake on a regular basis. We actually, this is hot off the press, but as of an hour ago this morning, we just posted um, a new live website that allows a public list of 500 companies, uh, many 
500, Fortune 100 that are currently hiring for students. Um, and it is a public list that people can search for based on industry, as well as based on location, if that's helpful for students. So I'll put that in the chat box so everybody can, um, can have access to that. And we're actually working on a few projects that will get each of our institutions in product dashboards of it, specifically who is hiring within their own institutions as well. So we're seeing quite a bit of good activity, even though it has certainly dropped if you're comparing it from last year. Obviously, we're seeing that across all industries. But as Farouk mentioned, I think in last week's or a couple weeks ago when we did the vision chat, there are certain industries that are not seeing the hit nearly as much as, say, hospitality or tourism or um, restaurants. You know, healthcare is still up there. We're seeing education is still posting quite rapidly. Government is still posting and obviously tech. So those are some of the industries that we're seeing within Handshake and when, within the early talent market that is still um, still moving forward. Okay. So you know, I, I find it intriguing today. that how different this feels in some ways from the past two financial crises that we've seen over the last 20 years or so. And I guess I'm dating myself when I say that, but I was in recruiting on Wall Street in 2001, right after 9-11, when you basically just saw programs being canceled left and right. Mm -hmm. It was a panic mode. People just didn't know what was going to go on. Obviously, working in Wall Street, I had a very you know, tilted view of looking at what was happening within the financial sector. But you saw the same thing happening in programs like consulting and technology. Everybody just kind of put recruiting activity to a grinding halt. Then you look at 2008, and you saw you know, some of that to the same degree. I, I know when I was at Maximus at the time, we did actually cut some programs, but we didn't want to cut the entire campus recruiting program at the time. We just took a look at programs that we thought were probably more financially viable to run long term. We started thinking what makes sense for our business model and made some cutbacks, but again, no eliminations of programs. I think if this go around, it feels more like the conversation is largely about transformation. How do we alter existing programs as opposed to just canceling them. And I think that those conversations have been quite rampant over the last two or three weeks or so. And, and Dave, you, you work for a company that, that uh, serves government, right? Uh, right. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how that's, um, um, that's impacting your own recruiting, what you see happening in government. In, in of course, Farouk, yeah. If you don't know anything about Maximus, we cover uh, work for government agencies, particularly the ones that are focused on either public health care or social services. So our largest contracts are with programs like Obamacare, Medicaid, Medicare, human services programs like welfare to work programs. We're managing all the customer service programs for the U.S. Census right now, which is a huge project for us. These are all essential services that the government can't shut down. So we're still in full hiring mode and we're actually trying to figure out how do we get more creative? And I think that's one of those things that is going to happen as a result of COVID-19 is that employers were already getting creative in terms of the war on talent, you know, previous to this, these COVID-19 discussions. Now we're trying to figure out how do we more creatively operate all of our existing recruitment and talent acquisition programs. We're having to get that much more savvy. And I think it's something that will have long-term repercussions. I don't think these are things that will be just short term. But, yeah, in I would, of, but in terms of our numbers, we're fortunate in that we are seeing a potential increase on demand for services, particularly when you look at, say, for example, a welfare to work program, helping welfare recipients find jobs. And typically we hire case managers that would actually be helping individuals living on welfare benefits find access to careers. There's going to be more need for that now than ever. So we expect to see some increases in something like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David, I was going to uh, add to a couple of things that you've, you, you've mentioned, um, which is uh, we're finding the same thing in the surveying that we're doing of general employers, which is that there is um, a pause uh, before decision making. Uh, so uh, organizations seem to be uh, taking a, uh, a longer stretch of time to make decisions about where they're going to go and how they're going to do it. And we also see some optimism. Uh, with all of it. So there isn't a rush to make uh, a decision about what's going to happen three months from now or four months from now. Um, we're finding that there is a wait and see. Uh, and so um, there's, there's a lot of promise in terms of the job market based on that. So, you know, when we asked, for instance, um, 
about uh, recruiting, uh, what re recruiting will look like in the fall. Uh, uh, and for employers who traditionally recruit on college campuses, you know, are they going to mm. be increasing? What are they going to do? Are they going to decrease the number of, uh, of people that they're hiring? And basically, the vast majority are saying, we don't know yet. Um, and we were, were, were in a wait and see. Um, we're being optimistic. <laughs> and so uh, that, that's promising. And then in the short term, I think what you, we also saw um, is related to these internships. So going back to the internship conversation, which is that um, uh, companies are still making those decisions. Um, they're still trying to figure out how to navigate through it because they, they don't want to lose these great uh, resources that they have and these candidates that they've hired because they know long term uh, they um, will benefit the company. Uh, and so you're finding that there's much more of a willingness for those companies to get creative um, and to do things like shorten internships, uh, to move them to the virtual space. Um, but most companies weren't prepared for that. And so they are needing to put plans into place to make sure that they are accessible, to make sure that they can truly fulfill on those before uh, making the final decision. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of the same, uh, the same data, Sean, as what you just mentioned. I think for us, we saw about 57% of our employers are telling us that they're kind of in a let's wait and see, let's evaluate sort of um, each week, honestly, almost it's each week as it comes and what the business impact is going to be. Um, I know I've talked to a lot of university partners that are really interested in trying to work with employers to switch internships to be remote or to think about options that will still allow their students to gain experiences. Um, and I know some recruiters within certain organizations have been trying to figure out how do I make that case for senior, for the sort of senior management to really consider that um, that shift. And I know that was one of the questions that folks had written in for all of us to talk about. And I'd be curious what your perspectives are, Sean and, and David, especially because you've been on the employer side. I know at least from what I'm hearing and certainly would be true within Handshake and our own company is you have to make the business value and sort of impact um, very clear. I think all of our employers would agree that early talent is quite important for the future and the success of their company long term. And so they don't want to sort of cut off that pipeline, but it is important that they're uh, able to think about what is the immediate business value and impact that having a virtual sort of experience could have for to convince the senior ups to, to move that direction. Is that sort of what you're hearing from your colleagues as well? Um, Christine, we made our decision probably about at least three or four weeks ago. We actually were able to make it fairly quickly, which I do think is uh, you know, probably relatively unique compared to a lot of my peers that are doing the same kind of recruiting. But we took a look at what some other recruiting leaders were doing. And then we also had a couple of very frank conversations with a couple of our senior business leaders and then a number of the managers that oversee our various internship programs, because we have about eight or 10 different types of internships and different stakeholders running those programs. What we really wanted to push, and, and we clearly had an agenda, let's be clear. Our campus recruiting team felt just based on the research that we were seeing that it really didn't make sense for us to try and run a hands-on um, brick and mortar type of internship program for the summer, particularly since we have them across mm -hmm. multiple offices. We have so many people that need to relocate. We just didn't think it was a very good idea accessibility for these students to have to try and find housing in a very fluid environment. So for us, it just felt like the right thing to do for us uh, morally, quite frankly. Um, the way we actually pushed this out to management is we took a look at a bunch of research data out there. In particular, we referenced the Scott Resource Group study that I think was po uh, posted on the NACE website about a year ago, taking a look at the factors that interns consider when they're thinking about taking a full-time offer from that corporation. And we saw about eight or 10 factors. And we looked at them and said, you know, of these eight or 10 distingu distinguishing factors, we actually think we could reasonably replicate at least 80 or 90% of them in some type of virtual environment. It's going to take some fixes. There are certain things we can't do. 
uh, if social activities were, I think it was like six or seven or something on the list, and we know we're probably not going to be able to take students to a baseball game or take them to a concert or things like that. But there were parts to it that we felt we were already doing fairly well that we could move to some type of virtual platform. Executive chat, say, for example, one of the things that a lot of the interns in these polls were saying is that the more time I get with senior management and the more exposure I get, the better my chance of actually accepting this offer. So we started rethinking this. We talked to our CEO, say, for example, I had a quick conversation um, on the phone with our CEO and just said, a large part of why our interns at Maximus really appreciate the internship experience is that they get time with our CEO. He actually does a series of lunches with all of our interns over the summer, which we think is fantastic. So how do we recreate something like that? So, you know, you can do virtual lunches. Companies do that. You know, organizations do that. So we just kind of piece together what we think we can make work for us. And thankfully, our managers fell in line. I think the biggest pushback that we're still getting that I think we're still trying to figure out, and I think it is a very, again, a very fluid environment, is how are we going to ensure that the students get the same day-to-day, hour-by-hour engagement that they would typically get in a live environment? So we think there's going to be a lot of change management required for the hiring managers and the buddies for these interns that we're going to have to really work through in the next couple months before the interns start. Um, yeah, that's uh, really helpful, David. I think um, just to reiterate, what we've found so far in our polling is that about 38% of the employers are polling are moving to the virtual uh, internships um, and that 37% are delaying the start date of the internship. And that start date has to do with the quality, of course, and making sure that's quality and that systems and processes are set up and they're able to, to do it. Um, and we'll give everyone a little bit more time. However, I think uh, also to Christine's earlier point, um, this is very industry specific, right? Um, so there are, and it's, it's a company size specific in some cases. And, you know, you're, you're, you're seeing different impacts based upon, you know, a small employer, medium sized employer, a large employer, and what they can do and the industries that they're in. And so, you know, a manufacturer, as an example, um, and their internships, they're not able to move virtual. They just, that, they're, they're, that's just not something that they're capable of doing. And so, those are the kinds of organizations that are having to make a pivot in a different way and to think about their future workforce in a different way. And the environment has, has, has caused some um, uh, real interesting issues um, around um, whether or not they continue those internships, even though they have people working in plants or, or in other areas, and should they bring that group uh, come, uh, in to work with their full-time staff. Um, you know, nonprofits is an example. So I come from uh, the nonprofit sector as a previous CHRO. And I can tell you um, certain kinds of nonprofits are canceling. They're just canceling internship programs all out, flat out. Um, museums is an example. Pretty widely throughout the system, um, internships have just been flatly canceled out. And those are large numbers of, of, of students as an example. So you do have to look at the sector by sector, industry by industry, um, and and so that's that's where some of the nuance comes in with all of this. And I think that that's exactly the starting point for all of us who are looking at the impact of COVID nineteen on college students, on people looking for work, and on people who have work, and on on employers. Um, this is, I think, in my opinion, how uh, this economy that we find ourselves in is different from 2008, from 2001, from the past recessions, uh, because this is happening out of the, um, uh, you know, a natural disaster, if you will. It's a, it's, a, it's a pandemic. One question that I often give to people is like, I imagine if this happened in a different era where we didn't have the technological advances that we have today, what would that look like and what would that feel uh, like? And the, the, the truth is that because we have access to technologies that allow us to work remotely, to learn remotely, to interact and engage remotely, to do these types of things, we are able to really treat this as not a total economic collapse, but rather a paradigm shift in the, in the economy, certainly with huge profound um, uh, consequences on some sectors of the economy. So, that's exactly right, Sean, is that some, you have to look at it sector by sector. 
So when I look at um, the impact of COVID-19 on just our life in general in our society, I start first with how is this impacting revenues? Because you've got to start there. You have to start with, with the money, unfortunately, and how it's impacting um, um, uh, the, the bottom line for a lot of our organizations. And the truth is for a lot of sectors within this economy, the impact is really profound and negative. I mean, a lot of companies are gonna find themselves or already are in the, in the red right now as a result of this. And it is not sustainable. They can try to hang in there for a little while until, this, uh, until recovery, if you will. But we all know as we, we see this moving on that, before, uh, that unless we have testing uh, for COVID, uh, across the board, available to everyone, and, and without eventually a vaccine, we are in this for the long haul. So the impact, the financial impact is profound on lots of sectors, and that's why you're going to see um, uh, a shift in, uh, in, in the labor market as a result of that. And I think the percentages you shared earlier of uh, uh, how many companies and organizations are revoking internships are what we're already seeing on our college campus, for example, and some of the college campuses that I've looked at. Um, there is a profound impact on how we work. Clearly, we're, look, we're, we're doing it now. And keep it in mind that not every job can be done remotely or virtually. So there's an impact on those. The average company has a cafeteria probably, has uh, food services, food and beverage services, has all sorts of departments that can no longer run virtually. Um, and you can keep them on the books for a little while, but you go long enough with this, then you, you're going to start uh, peeling those layers off. And that is true for college campuses, for schools, for nonprofit organizations. So the, we have not seen the bottom of, uh, of this yet. Um, there is uh, an impact clearly on how we learn. Um, and there's a shift here. So uh, again, the uh, the typical um, classroom that we know and the, 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 and the conferences that we go to, to to learn and professional development opportunities are all out of the equation for a period of time. And then again, the longer you take this, the, the, the more we settle in to a new way of doing things. Um, and uh, there is a, a profound impact in how, what we buy. So think of just the four of us, the things we've been buying for the last four months are probably quite different from what we've buying for the last four years. Um, I don't know about you, but I haven't really been looking at clothes um, or shoes <laughs> as much as I, 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 I did before. I'm not a shoe person anyways, but, for, but uh, I think you are. <laughs> so I'm not sure how many people are shopping for shoes anymore because most of us are in screens, you know, at, at the top here. So that's just, you know, a humorous example for how this is shifting the consumer behavior. You look at all of this, you can, you know, and if you do this for a couple of weeks, for a month, for a couple of months, we can come back to normal. This is gonna go on for several months. And it does not mean that the whole, that the sky will fall. It just means that we are going through this long tunnel and a paradigm shift that's gonna take us to a place where more work will work, more work, work will be done virtually and uh, remotely in the future. Uh, online learning will be a thing, um, uh, not of the future, but of the present and a normal thing. And it'll be hard for people to make decisions to go back to a, a typical residential experience that costs a lot of money. Um, and we'll be, we'll be buying things differently in the future. So you think of that and then you start to build the, sec the economic sectors of the future that will emerge. Uh, really appreciated the study that Handshake did on this and they gave in their in my most recent um, uh, release the five industry sectors uh, that came out uh, of that. I might not remember all of them off the top of my head, but uh, um, uh, software and technology is one, K through 12 education. And what I'm hearing in that is it's really online, the online pieces uh, of that because that's where it's headed. Um, healthcare and healthcare care equipment, even though right now, when you think of healthcare, um, uh, it is a sector that is losing a ton of money. Like that's where I think sometimes people, the, the person's psyche doesn't, uh, that doesn't think about is you think that because it's a pandemic, healthcare must be just thriving right now. It's actually losing a lot of money because of all of the elective surgeries and treatments and medicine 
that is not happening now as a result of COVID-19. That's a huge loss of revenue that you can bet is gonna end up on the books and it's going to translate into future budget cuts, et cetera. So it is not a complete grim picture, but I wanna make sure that it's a realistic picture, but at the same time, it is a paradigm shift. And for those of us and for college students and for job searches and companies, that can be that can look into the future and shift to their own strategies and thinking and skills um, accordingly. Those are the ones who are going to make it sooner than others. Uh, Farouk, can we go back to your comment about like the online shopping and things like that? Because I think when I look at my own patterns in terms of where I've gone online and actually bought things in the last four or five weeks, sometimes out of sheer boredom. I'm not going to lie, but. Um, I do find myself sticking to a select group of companies to which I feel a certain degree of loyalty that I want to see stay in business. Mm -hmm. The same way that on occasion when I order out and I get sick of my own cooking and I said I need to have a meal from outside, I'm sticking with the same two or three mom and pop shop restaurants within my neighborhood that I don't want to see closed down. There's a part of me that wonders if in the near future, you know, or, or maybe in the distant future, who knows whenever I get out of this, but the idea that the way that companies treat their employees during this period of time is also going to have a profound effect on what's going to be taking place in the future is, will we see a shift back to longer term loyalty to certain employers that uh, employees felt did the right thing during this period of time? I think there are going to be a number of measuring sticks that pop up as a result of some of this. I, I know I'm, I'm totally with you. It's it's about who does the right thing, but also it's about their ability to do right, the right. Their thing. ability to do the right thing as well. Correct. At the end of the day, it's about whether or not they have the cash reserves to be able to do the right the the the, the right thing. Right. No. Yeah. No. I think you're right, and I think early on, particularly those companies that you know made early decisions to lay off or furlough those kinds of things, um, employees were um, quite upset, and and customers were quite upset. Um, but I think the tide has turned. I, I'm, I'm thinking the tide turned a little bit on that because it's, it's the question of, you know, we're all in this together, you know, that, that sentiment that, that things had to shift and, and moved in a direction in order to um, preserve the financial stability of the entire system in a way. While the individual needs might not be getting met, there's a, a, a greater economic impact that's the, the wider view as, as you were talking about for that and the greater financial implications around the world. And so I think there's gonna be a little bit more forgiveness. Um, I think we may see a little bit more forgiveness because there were so many organizations in it together, um, but it's, certainly it's, a, it's an unknown. It was something, um, David, that you said a little bit earlier, and Farouk, you sort of alluded to as well, that I think is kind of interesting during this time. You both talked about sort of creating value, new value, in sort of this new world that we live in, whether it's virtual, what that could potentially look like. And I, I know that I've been challenged with this as I work with my own team and as we work with our university partners in particular, um, but I think it's really important that we not try and just replicate what we were doing in person virtually, right? Yes. I think we actually have to re-ask, I think we have to ask different questions is essentially what I'm saying. And I think as we look at where things are going for the fall, I know many universities are sort of in the process of figuring out, are we going to open? Are we going to delay fall semester? Are we going to just have an online experience? What is that gonna look like? And I know there's, I mean, you've all probably saw the New York Times article from a couple of days ago. There's so much pressure financially for people to sort of figure that out. And there are gonna be a lot of implications that come out of that. And I think more importantly, we should probably be asking ourselves, what's the value that comes out of some of these in-person interactions that we had? And how might we be able to capture that virtually, but not replicate or not try and be exactly the way it was done before, mm -hmm. which is right now, I sort of feel like there's still a little bit of a panic from folks in trying to like replicate what it is that they're used to seeing rather than actually rethink the way in which we might be able to create new value or to capture value, but in a new way 
that looks different from anything that we have um, been able to do in the past. And I'm curious from all of your perspectives, I mean, Sean, you literally just started a new job um, in the midst of all of this. And David and Farouk, you work at very different types of institutions. What are the conversations looking like within your own peers and colleagues in actually rethinking um, what the new normal could be rather than just try and replicate um, sort of an in-person to virtual? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so uh, 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 one point to support what you're saying, Christine, is uh, it, it can be uh, it can be seen in um, uh, the uh, outcry for tuition reimbursement or discounts uh, across the country now, especially at private colleges, um, that students are basically saying, "Wait, you just put my classes online and you're still charging me the same tuition?" Because really, in their mind, the value was much bigger than just go to a classroom. For them, it's the full college experience, but if all you're going to give me now is a course online, then, and I'm not getting the rest, uh, then I should, I should get a refund. Whether they're right or wrong, um, that, you know, that, that, that's to be seen, uh, but certainly the question is on the average family kitchen table. Is, is it worth it now to, to, to pay for this? Uh, maybe for a couple of months, but if this becomes a semester, a year ongoing, that's the, the question that we've been all grappling with for a number of years, the value of higher education and is it worth it, we're finally here, you know, like now it is, uh, it is posed. That's first. Second, I ask the same question, uh, the same, uh, I make, make the same state statement to a lot of my teams at Johns Hopkins, is that if, you know, it's fine to add the word virtual to everything for a couple of weeks. But if that's all we're doing months from now, that is literally malpractice at this point. And unfortunately, I see that across the board. Oh, I'm, I'm afraid that we will see that across the board, that just adding virtual to everything, having online resources, and then just keep telling people um, we support you, you can only get away with that for, for, for a while. Um, at some point, you're going to have, fairly soon, you're going to have to work at shifting your own practice and paradigm so that you can offer at least similar, if not better value than what you offered before. And I think that's, so I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you on that. I would add um, that, you know, one a statistic that we had that goes along with this conversation was that of the career centers um, across the U.S. that we've surveyed, and this is of about 520 um, that responded. This was as of Tuesday. The numbers, again, are shifting every day. We'll have new results soon. Um, but 24% of those career centers across the U.S. have already made the decision that they're going strictly virtual for what would have been on-campus interviews from employers in the fall. So there's already this prediction and the mm -hmm. sentiment that things have to shift or that they will shift. And, and to your point, but what does that really mean? And how is that executed? And are, 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 is it the same experience that someone may have um, as the on-campus? And are you just doing a replication? Um, and uh, how does that translate both to the employer, um, but also to the student experience with it all? And those are, are, are really interesting questions that have to, to be resolved along the way. And also, for I, I appreciate um, the sentiments about about this that you were giving because one of the things that we're finding is that anecdotally um, those organizations that are doing more than just sending out meaning colleges and universities that are doing more than just sending out messages and saying hey we've got this nice information session mm -hmm. please come to it or or i have you know we have a, a a recorded session on interviewing tips or whatever it may be um, but that are taking the step to actually pick up the phone and call students um, or encouraging them to make the call through a personalized email as an example, as a first step, and then following up with a phone call or, or encouraging that in a very personalized way are actually finding um, that their um, impact, they feel as though their impact has been much greater and right. that they're reaching many more mm -hmm. students than they ever have. Uh, and that's a really powerful thing because right now uh, our students need our help. 
Um, and, you know, there's a tremendous amount of stress in the marketplace. And, and it's up to all of us to help each other through that stress. And so those career centers can really make a, an, a, an immediate impact and one that's going to yeah. help everyone in the long term. And besides calling students, I'd, I'd also add in the fact that I, I also see a lot of impact of the employer, excuse me, the university really, um, career services folks picking up the phone and calling employers for that matter mm -hmm. to find out what's going on, to yeah. see if there are offerings that they can provide or partnerships that they can be creating or just being part of our solution. And one of the things that I think we kind of missed out on a little bit in Maximus, when we're making some of our early decisions about whether or not to go virtual, somebody mentioned after we made the decision, did you ever think to pick up the phone and call any of your career centers to get them for some buy-in or see if they had suggestions about any of this stuff? And to be honest, we made the decision so quickly, it felt like it was in a vacuum to a certain degree, that it's something we just didn't really factor in. And when I think back on it now, I said, yeah, we might have actually done it even better if we'd actually brought those folks mm -hmm. in. Absolutely, yeah, and I, mm -hmm. I um, um, appreciate the sentiment that it's not a, a general general communication that just comes from a university or from some type of uh, account that it, it is personalized. Um, at Hopkins, you know, our staff have rosters uh, that are that they are accountable for, and within those rosters, we ask that we they not only know who their students are in those rosters, and they are communicating directly with the, with, with them from their names, not from just some um, uh, account, but they know who their first generation students are on those rosters, the limited income students, underrepresented minorities, and international students um, uh, within those communities. And then there's very specific outreach to them, inviting them to all of the interventions um, that uh, we're doing. The, um, I mean, it, it, I've, I've always been pushing for this model that staff within universities have to be accountable to groups or communities of students rather than just be generalists waiting for students to come to you. Because when you're accountable to a community or group for students, then we can measure the impact, not only for the students who are assigned to you, but also for the underprivileged and under, underrepresented communities. Um, and that allows us to move the needle much faster, to dig way deeper, and to know where the inequities are in, and especially now in the COVID-19 world, it is exposing all sorts of inequities from access to internships to the ability to, uh, to uh, uh, study remotely um, and virtually the pressures that, that these students have at, uh, to, to deal with at home. And I, we need to have staff who are accountable for these things. And then the last thing I want to add is that the, the power of our alumni networks within institutions to use them not only to support and mentor these students, but also to um, help us identify opportunities, whether they're project based or, or remote, uh, even if they're short term within their own organizations and companies. Um, that's probably something that you're seeing uh, uh, on your own as alums of your own alma maters, but also as but within your own networks. I'll just add in here because I think this is also a really important topic. Most of the conversations, webinars, town halls that um, we've all been engaging in were obviously naturally very focused on career related experiences that our students are going to be able to have to sort of set them up for the future. But we have a huge population of students that quite frankly don't have the privilege to hold out for those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I know that's a real concern for a lot of our students. We're seeing, we saw survey, I think 89% are willing to take a part-time job right now just to make ends meet or just to get by or it's related or unrelated to what it is they want to do. I think it's 69% are willing to do gig work, whereas before they had not considered that before. Um, and I think it's really important that just in our own narratives and as we talk that we not take a privileged stance that one type of experience is necessarily better than another at this particular point in time because a job is a job. And we have a lot of students that need to either pay the bills or they need to help support their families that unfortunately maybe their parents have lost their jobs. Um, and so I just, I think that's, that has to be part of our conversation as we, um, as we think about who we're serving and sort of what is being perpetuated over and over um, 
in the narrative. Sorry, I feel strongly about this. So I just no, no, and I'm with you, Christine. <laughs> with that. I'm, I'm completely with you, Christine. Uh, Farouk and I were chatting about this about two weeks ago, and I think that's one of the things that led me to led him to invite me to this particular chat. But I ran an idea by him that we've been contemplating that I think looks like it's going to come to fruition in the next week or so. We, you know, at Maximus, our mission is helping government serve the people making sure that vulnerable populations get access to jobs, get access to health care, et cetera. So we feel a high degree of corporate social responsibility in those areas. From a campus recruiting standpoint, you were talking before more about value add and uh, reinvention and things like that. We were trying to figure out how it is that our campus recruiting team can step into some of the voids that we have in our talent acquisition team and maybe repurpose some of our capabilities. We were looking at this idea that all of a sudden, You've got millions of college students that have been displaced. You've got countless numbers that needed access to federal work study monies, that needed to be teaching assistants, that needed to take on some kind of income or were working part time to your point just to make ends meet so they could attend college. So could we create opportunities in our organization that actually could meet up with their requirements to earn some income but also give them some kind of experiential learning that might actually help for academic credit. That's great. So, and, and Farouk liked this idea a lot, so we, we ran with it. So we look at this idea that since we do so much work when it comes to healthcare enrollment, helping people get access to Medicaid, Medicare, working in a call center per se, we're seeing a lot of shifts in terms of need for talent because you have instances where Somebody gets diagnosed with COVID-19 that works in an operations center, an office. And keep in mind, we actually have moved about half of our uh, staff to remote status, but we haven't even been able to move all of them. It's one of those gradual purposes, but we need access to remote staff quickly. Mm -hmm. Our idea here is could we create some type of work opportunity that might enable a student, particularly if they're studying something like a foreign language, if they're studying public health, social services, social welfare, could we create a 30 to 40 hour a week position for those individuals so they could actually do both? Earn some income, work from home to do it. All they would need is some type of laptop, some type of technology. We know that not everybody has that and I think we're in a position to provide it to those that don't. But it's a model that we think we can launch fairly quickly. We could work with the Office of Students with Disabilities at respective universities. We could work with the Office of student financial aid, obviously partnering with the career centers to be able to reach out to those departments. But it's something that's gaining some very quick tra uh, uh, traction within our workforce. And I, I hope that other organizations are starting to think in the same way. Yeah, I think, you know, you've both mm -hmm. touched on uh, really interesting points around, particularly around inequities um, and how they end up getting addressed. And, and to Brooke's earlier point, this is maybe a shift. Uh, this is a shift in, in the way that companies think about this. It's a shift in the way that universities have to think about this in terms of that support that they're giving to students as they're uh, obtaining internships or they're, they're moving on to the world, but particularly around those internships. And I know one of our um, the questions that came through is around those inequities. What, what do you do about students who don't have those resources, right, to, to be able to work from home uh, virtually? They're not set up right now to do that. They, don't, they can't do that. So what, what then becomes the responsibility of that employer and what the responsibility of the educational institution to help to support um, those endeavors? And then what's the partnership between all of those, right? And that's what David's really talking about here is, is that partnership and what companies can do. And a, what we're seeing is that a lot of the larger corporations are indeed providing that kind of support that David is suggesting, which is, um, you know, we can, you know, think about how to support you in that virtual environment. You know, if you would have come to the office, we would have given you a computer to work on. So therefore, we're going to mail you the laptop. Okay, let's talk about uh, internet connectivity. What does that mean? How can we you know, embrace this? Is, are there other places that you can work, et cetera? Now that's, um, that's, you know, not every employer is going to do that or can do that. Um, and so we've got to have some shift in thinking, some paradigm shifts uh, to, to mm -hmm. Baruch's point earlier around all of this in terms of the support that's really being given because it's, it's this, these inequities are really going to uh, be front and center, particularly uh, this summer. 
one of my recruiters actually even pointed out something that seemed so small at the time. And then I, when I actually shared it with other campus recruiting leaders, nobody really thought about it either. Even just the idea of typically we're sending swag to all of our interns. We're providing that in the first day. So a t-shirt and you know, a baseball cap or a cup or something like that, which you still want to be able to do. But in this instance, we need to start thinking about office supplies, things for them to be able to do their day-to-day -day work that we normally wouldn't think about that cost money, you have to go out there and buy these things. And again, not everybody has access to do that, so. That's right, that's yeah. right. And, and do you need them even in the future? Right. That's the other question. Uh, um, what, another point I wanted to make, so there were a bunch of questions around virtual um, career fairs. And I did, I do have some statistics from our polling that I thought uh, might be interesting to pull out. Um, we found that 14% um, of our college uh, uh, centers, career centers, are saying that they're not planning to hold career fairs in the fall at all. Um, so that's 14%. Um, and we found that five, only 5% 5 so far are saying that they're gonna move to strictly virtual fairs. So we kind of have um, some numbers at play here that are low. I will tell you that about 40% of our respondents so far to this question around virtual uh, career fairs have basically said, we don't know. It really depends on what happens and how things proceed. So there's a lot that's up in the air. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, Christina must know how how I feel about this. So I'll uh, I'll, I'll share it with the world. Uh, and uh, I have some opinions about career fairs in general. And then you you slap the word virtual to it, and then it gets me all linked up. So let me, let me go there. Um, Look, uh, the mistake that I think most of us in higher education make is that we think that the number we we think the number of employers who register for virtual career fair is a measure of hiring. It is not. Ver uh, career fairs in general are treated as trade shows. Um, uh, they are branding activities for a lot of companies. Does that mean that some companies don't recruit there? Of course, there are companies that recruit there and there are some jobs that are out there, but go back and look at any of your numbers and if and I dare any institution to send me a number that says, or a, a percent a data that, that shows that a high percentage of your college hiring comes from your careers. That doesn't mean that they need to go away, but don't be mistaken with, uh, uh, by the idea that this is an effective tool to get your student, students hired. Think of it almost as trade shows. Even when a company doesn't have a new product, they'll still show up because they don't. They need to be seen and they need to be there. Um, I'm painting broad strokes here, I know, and there are some exceptions, but it is not the rule that virtual career fairs are effective. Um, what I'm not saying is don't do it. You know, certainly go ahead and do it. But what I am saying is don't think that because you have a virtual career fair that you're done and you have a high number of employers and you have higher number of students and then you it gives you the illusion of success but it is not a metric for hiring if you want to do this right really dig deep and have um, uh, hiring weeks or days where you are actually helping students and employers match and connect then you're really getting into the uh, use technology to do that partner with companies and with uh, vendors and with technology companies to do that but to just slap a vir virtual to a career fair and you think you're done, those are the mistakes that I'm afraid career centers will make. They'll, they'll post a page for online resources, they'll do virtual workshops, they'll do virtual career fairs, and then they keep their appointments and have virtual appointments and they think that they have responded to COVID. In my opinion, um, if that's all you do coming this fall, um, that's um, um, uh, a disservice to, uh, to your students and to your employers. Farouk, I think, um, you know, you do know how I feel about this as well. And obviously, I know your thoughts on, on fairs. A lot of what you're mentioning right now is precisely what I was talking about before and not trying to simply replicate an in-person event or program and move it virtual. And I know there were some questions in the chat box, so I'll answer those directly as well. Um, at Handshape, we are exploring some version of a virtual fair. So yes, that is an active conversation that we are having. But what I would say to that is we are practicing what I just preached, which is we're not looking to replicate or imitate what's already on the market. 
Instead, we are challenging our teams to truly think about what's the value proposition of health. Obviously, the value to career centers is that for many of you, that was a huge piece of your revenue, right? So there's sort of that sustainability piece that you might have to have. From a student perspective, it could be exploration and actually learning about a number of different employers or to Farouk's point, branding for an employer. For a smaller percentage, they might actually be recruiting and they might have open positions that they are actively taking applicants for and that they are looking to actually do interviews. So as we think about those particular value propositions, we're looking at how we could actually capture that experience. And I can't what exactly that's going to look like yet because we're in that process of sort of research and design. And so it might look, there might be elements that look similar to what people are used to when they think of fair or they think of virtual fair, but there could also be elements that quite frankly are not there anymore or look totally different because the, the point of this is not to replicate what already existed. The point is to think about what the value proposition is and how we might be able to capture those um, those components. And there may, we may also learn through this process that there are certain components that are not meant to be captured with this particular experience. There may be certain elements that are to be captured here, and there are certain elements that maybe should be captured in a different experience. And so I think, generally speaking, we all need to be open to what that, what that looks like. Um, and I think it's actually some of my most interesting conversations have actually been with people who know nothing about careers, um, know nothing about virtual career fairs or don't work in our space um, and asking them if you were trying to look for an opportunity or you needed to get a job right now, what is what kind of experience would you want, would you hope for? Um, and the ideas are, are sometimes aligned and sometimes quite different from, I think, how many of us think about it because we're so familiar with a particular paradigm. So right. anyway, I am excited to see what we can all come up with together. And I, and, and I love that. I mean, that's what we need Handshake to be doing, NACE and other co co corporate pro providers. Um, what we all should be prepared for is the potential reality this fall that you're not only, that we're not only trying to help um, to, to 2021 graduates obtain opportunities for next year and, and internships, but also still potentially a quarter of your graduating class of 2020 that is still looking for work or for opportunities that is either employed or underemployed. And they're gonna be coming back to you this coming fall. And um, the typical career fair idea, and then you add virtual to it, virtual on-campus recruiting, et cetera, because there is a high potential that campuses will not be open this fall in a residential way or a physical way, but rather in a more continued online distance and uh, distance learning. Um, we we have not we have not only to adjust but to completely shift our paradigms and our, our the way we think and the way we we work. So I'm glad you're pushing your team to do that, Christine. I, I will hope that all of us within universities. Uh, would uh, would be doing that, that we don't get so stuck in our own traditions and then just to add online to it and think that we're innovative, uh, but actually really push ourselves and dig deep to reimagine what the entire process looked like in order to provide similar or better value um, than what we had before. Okay. Farouk, can I add one thing to that as well? Because I've gotten a number of requests from institutions asking about our company's interest in a potential virtual career fair this summer. Um, the one thing I keep saying, and I've responded pretty much uniformly to all of them, is that if we're talking about just replicating your traditional all-student on-campus career fair and moving to a virtual environment, probably not interested. Now, that said, if you were willing to think about transformation here, the idea of having one big brick-and-mortar career fair versus the idea of perhaps having eight or 10 more customized virtual fairs that focus on students that are looking at specific disciplines or looking at specific types of companies, that might pique my interest. And if you look at the revenue, I, I know obviously institutions need to look at this as a source of revenue in many instances. So is that something that rather than doing one big one with 10 smaller ones that focus on specific industries, would that return some investment? I, you know, my gut feeling is probably yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want something more custom than what we're seeing right now. And I, I share that same frustration you've had with career fairs in general, is that yeah. we find that these big, huge campus career fairs, we've got to do an awful lot of work to get to a relatively small number of applicants. 
the more savvy applicants are finding us in different ways. But when we go to a career fair that's aimed at government and nonprofits, say for example, we tend to have very good days at those types of events because they're looking to do work that's very similar to what we have to offer. Yeah. I almost want to ask you the question of first, are you hiring before I allow you to register for a career fair? Are you seriously hiring and would you seriously consider our students? Right. Uh, and then if, and, and, and by way of doing that, I'm no longer really doing a career fair. I'm doing really a hiring activity. Right. That auto, you know, it's kind of like selling a house and having an open house. I don't, I'm not interested in having an open house and have a bunch of people just come and then at the end of the day not have any offers. Right. I really want to just show the house to um, the people who are really looking to buy. So the same, the same concept. That's really where, where career fairs trick me for, for, uh, uh, personally. Yeah, you're shifting the purpose, right? Like you might still have an open house, but you want to have an open house with the people who are serious about actually making an offer. So you're, you might still have a similar type thing, but you're shifting the purpose. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying I think that these things could do, that every uh, school should do 10 fairs. I do think that it could be feasible to 10 virtual fairs yeah. if we're talking about changes for the fall. But I do realize logistics and um, you know, getting space and things like that would make that a very difficult proposition for just a better Exactly. Person. Well, look, this was a fascinating conversation. In the last minute that we have in this hour, I want to ask of you about your vision for the future. What will colleges look like in the future and what will work look like uh, in the future and the inter interaction between the, the two in uh, maybe 10 or 15 seconds each? How about to start with you, Christine, while, while, while Dave is thinking? <laughs> Christine. Sure. I actually answered this question uh, quite interestingly for a group of faculty yesterday. So I'll start with universities. I think in the future, career education will be more deeply embedded into the academic experience from the provost all the way down to the faculty sort of department level. It'll be embedded into the syllabi in terms of converting and explicitly noting how pedagogy relates to career competencies so that that's clear for students. There will be more assignments and integration with industry into what is being taught from liberal arts to engineering to business. Um, and I would actually love to see an expiration date on all curriculum um, so that faculty every two to three years are sort of required to relook at what they're teaching and how they're teaching it so that it's most relevant. Um, and I would love to see faculty have opportunities that are built into their training development and um, uh, tenure process to actually experience and essentially do field trips with industry so that they can start to think about how their own discipline could provide new ways of thinking within a particular area and so that they feel more comfortable incorporating that into uh, into their into their teaching and learning and so that's where I see the the confluence of employers and universities coming together very cool um, I would just add on to uh, Christine's uh, great job. Thank you so much. That was that was excellent. I would uh, the two words I would use to do this quickly would be um, higher education will be much more personalized uh, in that education, and it will be more flexible um, based upon all of these experiences that we're going going through. And then I would say on the uh, em employer employment side that it's going to uh, be uh, a, a little leaner. Um, and it is going to uh, be a lot more virtual. Mm, very good. Dave? Um, same as what Sean said. The one thing I'll add to it is that from a recruiter standpoint, will we be operating in the same kind of model in that a, a company like Maximus and other firms that recruit nationally, will they continue to go to a, the same group of core schools looking to get them hired to a very specific location. So will a DC based company like Maximus be able to recruit at national universities all across the country with the thinking that our students going to be more reserved about making big moves across the country, moving away from family, moving away from financial stability with their families in theory to take a new job. I'm just not sure if they're going to be willing to take those same risks anymore. And I think it's something we might have to evaluate. 
Fascinating. Well, I see a future without shoes in it. So uh, we'll see what happens. Um, this was a fascinating conversation. Um, I love the three of you. And um, um, I could spend an entire uh, other hour just talking about this stuff. Thank you all so much for everyone who tuned in today. Uh, please tune in again for future Vision Chats at Johns Hopkins, where we will discuss the future, what will happen, uh, and how we can be proactive about it. Uh, many thanks to all of you, and uh, go spend some time uh, with your families and uh, at the beach or outdoor, and uh, stay safe. Uh, we're going to get through uh, all of this. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Good luck, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Kirk. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.